I once knew a girl named Jericho. I think I was in love with her, but I was also 17, so maybe I didn't know what love was yet. I know I was excited when she was around, and getting her to laugh or doing something that made her think I was smart or brave, even something small, always made me happier than just about anything else. I know that I still wake up most nights shaking and crying, hearing her screams as they drug her down the hall. We had been hanging out, our version of casually dating, for about six months when we started going for wander walks. We'd pick a starting point, drive out there, and then spend the afternoon or early evening wandering around until we eventually made our way back to the car. More than once, we got a bit lost, but that was part of the fun and excitement of it all, and she had a good enough sense of direction that we never stayed off course for long. It was during these walks that we learned more about each other and grew closer, away from other friends and school, our families, and the gravity of a world that wanted to change us and make us bend. On those wonder walks, we could be ourselves, alone and together. And if we fell in love, that's when it happened. The spring of our senior year, I had to go away one weekend to visit the State University's campus. I had no plan on going there. Jericho and I had already decided we were staying local for college in no small part so we could stay together. But my parents had both gone to state, and they wouldn't be satisfied until I at least visited the campus. It was only two days, and at the time it hadn't seemed like a big deal at all. It wasn't until I got back and saw Jerry that I realized something important had happened while I was gone. She was so excited when I got in her car that she looked ready to jump out of her skin. Some of it was being glad to see me, but not all, or even most. No, she was jittery, almost shaking with some kind of spastic joy that was intriguing, but made me more than a little worried, too. When I asked her what was going on, she just laughed and shook her head, told me she'd have to show me for me to believe it, but she'd tell me what was up while I drove. Okay, so I have two big things to tell you, but I'll start with, well, the way weirder one. So yesterday I was bored, and yeah, I was missing you, okay? So I decided to go for one of our walks. We've been talking about going out to some of the woods west of town, right? I thought this would be a good time to check out that area. If it sucks, we could avoid it down the line. If it was cool, I'd have a neat surprise for you when you got back. So I go, and I just drive around for a little bit. There's not a lot out there once you get past that trailer park on the highway in the landfill. I wound up stopping down at this little rideshare parking lot and walking into the woods from there. Go for a couple of hours, and I'm heading back through this kind of boggy area without too many trees when I see it. I'm already starting to feel nervous by this point, though I'm not sure why. See what? She gives a brittle laugh, her eyes still fixed on the road. (laughs) It was a hallway. I frowned, confused. Wait, I I think I missed something. Didn't you say you were walking out in the woods? In like a swampy area or something? Yep. Okay, so was there like a house or an abandoned building or something out there? What were you seeing? She shook her head. No, nothing like that. No buildings or anything. Just when I was walking there, I was focused on where I put my feet. The ground was soft in spots, and I didn't want to step on a water moccasin. But then I noticed my head was itching, and the hairs were standing up on my arms. It was kind of like that feeling of electricity, but different, too. Just, I could feel something was out there, yeah? Jericho turned and met my eyes briefly, and I nodded in confirmation. She looked oddly relieved as she looked back ahead and kept talking. So I started paying more attention to what was around. I didn't see anything at first, so I kept walking. Then suddenly I saw it. My voice sounded small in my own ears when I spoke. What was it? The corner of her mouth twitched slightly. It was a hallway, like I said. A long hallway that was dark, but... I could still see down it somehow. It seemed like it went on forever. Swallowing, I gave a laugh I didn't feel. 
<laughs> Sounds like you uh, fell asleep and had a weird dream. She cut her eyes towards me. No, it, it wasn't a dream. I, I thought of that. It's the first thing I thought of, but I was awake. And I took a couple of steps back, thinking I just missed or, or, or overlooked the building the hall was a part of, though I didn't see how, but... She paused and her lip trembled. Jerry, what's wrong? Shaking her head again, she put on her blinker and turned into the rideshare parking lot. I hadn't realized how far we'd gone. I told you, you need to see it. It took us close to an hour to reach the boggy area she described, and most of that time we walked in silence. Jericho made it clear after my first couple of tries that she didn't want to talk about it until we were there, and I had a chance to see if I saw the same thing she had. It worried me. She still seemed amped up and happy, but I could see some fear there now, too. Maybe it was just recalling those memories, or maybe it was knowing that every step was taking us closer to whatever strange thing she had found in the woods. Either way, when we reached a certain point, she stopped, telling me to keep going forward, watching my footing, but also keeping an eye out toward my right. I wanted to argue, but held back. I didn't think this was some weird joke she was playing. She was serious about whatever this was, believed in it at least enough to want me to see it too or verify that someone else saw it. So instead of arguing or asking more questions, I just nodded and kept moving forward. It only took a couple of dozen steps before I saw it. One moment I was looking out over a gray-green patch of mud and moss. The next I'm looking down an enormous hallway of black wood floors and gray marble walls that seem to stretch on forever. Sucking in a breath, I stopped in my tracks. I... I see it. I took a few steps back and let out a gasp as the hallway disappeared, and the different angle didn't give me any sign of a building or other structure that could explain how the hallway could exist. Where? Where's the building it's in? Jericho was beside me now, squeezing my hand. So you see it? Really? Feeling slightly dizzy, I took a few steps forward and nodded. Yeah. Fuck, how is that possible? I can only see it at a certain angle. Pressing closer to me, she whispered in my ear. I think so, yeah. Describe it to me. I just want to make sure... I just want to make sure you see it the same way I do. The unspoken implication wasn't lost on me. She wanted to make sure I wasn't lying and just humoring her. It hurt my feelings slightly that she thought I'd do that, but I pushed that aside. This was too important. Um, it's like really big, with black floors and gray walls that look like they're maybe stone or marble or something. She was quiet for a moment and then... It looks different for me. The floor's red. The walls are a deep, dark blue. I don't see any lights in there, but I can still see. I nodded distantly. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing for me, too. Shaking myself out of my stupor, I took a few steps farther away from the hall, pulling her with me. This thing, it's like an optical illusion? Somehow swamp gas is reflecting something from somewhere else? Jericho shook her head. No. It's real. I took a couple of steps in last time before I chickened out. I could feel the walls and everything. I gasped at her. You what? This thing, it, it has to be dangerous. What could cause this? Shrugging, she looked past me at the hall. I don't know. And 
Just because it's mysterious doesn't mean it's dangerous. Meeting my eyes again, she smiled slightly. And you don't have to go in if you don't want. Just keep a lookout. And if I don't come back out in a few minutes, go get help. I just stared at her. Help? <laughs> what kind of help? Hey, can you come help get my girlfriend out of this magic hallway she's stuck in? I think it's over in this swampy area, but it's invisible unless you're just at the right. She put two fingers over my lips. First, you just called me your girlfriend. Jericho grinned at me. Secondly, I see your point. I think... I think this place gets to you. I've been having a hard time not coming back here ever since I left. I made myself wait so I could show it to you, but just barely. Maybe I'm not thinking straight. Hard hammering, I turned to look back down the hall. I just... I mean, maybe it really is some kind of trick. Not swamp gas, I don't mean that. But maybe someone made it where it looks invisible from the sign, but it's really not. Her smile faded as she shook her head. No, I tried that. If you walk through the area where the hall should be from the side, you don't hit anything. It's just empty air from every angle except the one where you can see it. I puffed out a breath to try to keep my voice steady. <sighs> Jerry, this is really uh, amazing, but it's also not right. And we don't know where it goes or what... I trailed off the words stuck in my throat. Or what could be in there. Her voice was low and hollow as though any light or life had been dug out of its core. Giving her arm a squeeze, I nodded. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to be a pussy or anything, but we can't go in there, right? Sighing, she patted my hand. You're right. Of course, you're right. I don't know what we do with it, but we can't just go in. We shouldn't. She turned back the way we had come. Thanks for stopping me. We better head back before it gets too late. I felt a flood of relief as I turned to follow her and catching up. I took her hand. It's still really cool, though. We just... We just need to decide if we tell someone, or come back and take a video or something, or what. I just think we need to take it slow and be... Jericho had snatched free from me and was running back. As I turned to go after her, she suddenly juked to the right and... vanished into thin air. Screaming for her, I ran up to where I could see the hallway again, and to my relief and horror, I saw Jericho there. She was trotting down the hall, looking at the walls as she passed. She was twenty feet in, then twenty-five, thirty... I stared on in mute terror for a few more seconds, as though I was afraid any slight sound may wake the strange world slumbering around her. Finally, my panic and desperation overcame that fear, and I began to scream her name again. She paused then, looking back at me with a smile. Just stay there! I'm just going to look for a minute, and then I'll be... She was too far away for me to see her face clearly, but I could still see her body suddenly tense as she looked around. I... I think I heard something? A, a, a bell, maybe? Come back! Hurry up and come back! Jericho nodded and began running back much faster than she'd gone down the hallway, but it seemed like she was making very little progress. I could also tell she was still hearing things that I couldn't hear, and when she turned and looked out behind her, she let out a terrible scream. Oh god, oh fuck, help me! I looked behind her, but I didn't see anything. Maybe she was just scared and there was nothing behind her? I stepped closer to the threshold of the hall, feeling the crackling pressure of some force or membrane in front of me reaching the breaking point as I neared the edge of crossing over. I stepped closer to the threshold of the hall, feeling the cracking pressure of some force or membrane in front of me reaching the breaking point as I neared the edge of crossing over. It was then two things occurred to me. The first was the strangeness of Jericho running inside like that in the first place. She liked excitement, but she wasn't reckless or stupid. 
But hadn't she said the place had a hold on her? That even taking a couple of steps in and feeling the walls had been enough that she had to fight from going back here before I got home. What if that happened to me? And the hall. She said the hall looked different to her. Red floor instead of black. What if she was seeing and hearing whatever was chasing her was in her version of the hall? If I went in, could they get me too? Even if I couldn't see them? I pulled my hand back and took a few steps away from the hall. She was over halfway back now, though. I still didn't understand how it was taking so long. I'd just stay out of there, out of the way. I'd get her away from the hall once she was through, and in time she'd be okay again. That's when the first of them hit her, knocking her from her feet and sending her skidding back the way she had come. She let out a gasping wail, begging to help her as she started getting drugged backward by unseen hands. Again, I almost ran forward into the hall, but again, I stopped myself short of its edge. I, I, I'll get you help. Help me, help me now. Oh God, you're so cold. Her voice was high and wavering as she called me, and when I answered again, I was little more than a tearful whisper. I, I'm so sorry. I can't. I made myself watch as she was drug away into whatever lay beyond the edge of my sight. Her screams lasted longer, but there came a time when I realized I was just imagining the ghosts of those sounds now. Trembling, I sat down and waited for an hour, but there was no sign of her or anything else. I would have waited longer, but... The idea of being near that hallway after dark was more than even my crushing guilt could bear. So I left. I went back to town, reported her missing, said we'd gotten separated during our walk, which was true enough in its own way. I didn't mention the hallway. I didn't see the point. But I did take them to the general area where I lost her. Ten men and women and two dogs searched that area for hours, but they didn't find anything at all. I think I halfway hoped someone would see the hall, or even better, that everyone would, but no. No one ever saw anything out of the ordinary, and I made a point of staying far enough away I never caught another glimpse either. I thought I might have killed her, of course, especially when they talked to her doctor and found out she was eight weeks pregnant. One of the investigators flat out called me a murderer, said I dumped her in the swamp after I found out she was having my kid. I got locked up a couple of days for punching him, but after that they let me go. I moved away as soon as school let out, and in the ten years since I've never been back home, or even in that part of the country. I miss a lot of things about my life there, but the thing I miss the most is the one I've tried to forget. The last few weeks I haven't slept very well, waking up too early. At first I just tossed and turned until giving up and getting out of bed, but the past several days I've been going out for walks. Just wandering. I was walking past the old high school near my house when I heard a bell behind me. My first thought was that it was a school bell, but that couldn't be right. For one thing, it was barely past sunrise. For another, this ringing came from behind me, and it was very close. Turning around, I saw the hallway stretched out behind me. Tingling, tingling. The hall was darker than I remembered, the air thick with something that wasn't quite shadow or smoke, but an oily cousin of each. I was breathless and transfixed, my chest aching as my heart pounded and my lungs began to scream for air. I sucked in a gasping breath, and something stirred in the murk of the hallway. 
I let out a small cry, and then I ran away. It didn't matter. I can't run away from my past anymore, and I can't run away from the hallway for much longer either. It follows me, you see. At first, I would only see it at a distance from certain angles. After a few days, it started appearing behind me when I turned around. No one else can see it. And the more persistent it becomes, the harder it is to avoid stepping into it accidentally. But that's not why it'll get me, I don't think. It doesn't have its hooks in my brain the way it did Jerry. I never went inside, after all. But I still managed to bury a barb deep in my heart. Not when I didn't help my first girlfriend, or even when I left my old life behind for good. It was when I realized I do love Jericho, despite time and everything I did and didn't do. It was when I saw who was stepping out of the mists, ringing the bell solemnly, perhaps in greeting or warning. Or both. It was a woman. And just behind her, a small boy. I've been keeping a low profile, but I was prompted to write this because I've seen in the news that a certain billionaire just bought a chunk of land in Arizona to build a smart city. He's not the only one with that idea. And I have to warn people. I only barely survived the prototype. The protesters for the new smart city were bright and cheery. They promised a community designed from the ground up with every need handled and every desire satisfied. I wouldn't have to worry about a thing if I lived there, or so went to promise. I didn't move immediately, of course. It was only as my rundown neighborhood turned increasingly toxic and scary that I thought I'd give it a shot. So one chilly February morning, I packed up my meager belongings and set off for Gilmanton. After two nights spent sleeping in my car at rest stops, I saw the signs and I headed off the main highway for another few hours. Finally, there it was. The city was just a prototype and therefore not as big as Chicago or Seattle or anything like that. The high, silvery walls formed a circle whose edges just barely touched each side of a shallowy, scrubby valley. People were parking pretty much anywhere, since the protesters had promised we wouldn't need our cars anymore. But we still managed to create orderly rows by working together and being sensible about it. It felt like I was arriving near the opening hour of a massive theme park, and the gobs of people walking all around me were friendly and excited. We didn't even get annoyed while waiting in line for hours. It was slightly cold out, but the sun was up, and we talked endlessly about how bad it was everywhere else and how good we were going to make it inside. When I got to the automatic paperwork dispenser at the front of the line, I didn't waste everyone's time like the people before me. I signed my papers immediately, stood in place for my picture, and headed on in. Those behind me cheered, and the speed of the line picked up as they began to do the same. About one in ten of those before us had chosen to turn and leave with a disturbed look on their faces, but that intermittent defection stopped once we skipped reading the waivers. An enclosed technology system was the last stop, and here the system dispensed a bracelet. I marveled at the design. It was my key, my, my passport, my phone, and my computer all in one. We didn't need any other devices. Everyone had divulged all their old technology, but it happened I forgot that my phone was in my inner jacket pocket. The battery had died on the way down, too, so the scanner at the gate didn't raise an alarm when I went through. The first main street opened up before me as I stepped out under the February sun and into Gilmanton proper. The first official human being was there to greet each of us. 
he looked quite dapper in his fancy suit, and it turned out he was the mysterious billionaire that had built all of this. He shook my hand vigorously. Just call me Mr. Mudget. Nice to meet you, I said in awe. Where do we live in here? Pick any open residential apartment you like, he said graciously. First come, first serve, at least in this phase of the trial. That was great. I looked at a map on the city of my bracelet and looked for the highest apartment with the best view I could find. The ones next to it were already popping up as taken, so I ran over there and dashed up the stairs and tapped my bracelet to the wall computer just before another man. He griped a bit, but finally ran off to find another place for himself. Then, I sat in my new chair. The white-walled apartment was a bit more cramped than I'd expected, but it did contain a bed, a couch, a small kitchen area, in addition to the chair that faced the big glass window. Looking out, I could see down my street, and I was almost parallel with the top of the outer wall of the city. I'd expected more of a view, perhaps a lake or perhaps some of the terrain outside the walls, but it was fine. What more could I ask for in a free apartment? One of the walls did contain a television. The panel opened at the command of my bracelets, and I remained in my chair, changing the channels for a few minutes before I finally found a station. It appeared that there was only one station so far, which was fine. It was opening day, after all. The sole channel was Gilmanton News 1, and a well-dressed man and woman at a desk were reporting favorable stats of how well the first day of the city was going. After a few minutes, it occurred to me that the television was pretty loud and set right in the wall. Leaving it on, I went out to the dim brown walled hallway and knocked on my neighbor's door. It wasn't a typical door. It seemed to be made of metal with a wood layer over top to make it appear normal. All the doors were like that. It slid open to the left, and an attractive woman answered. I immediately stopped slouching and remembered to be polite, but Melanie hadn't noticed the noise from the television at all. See? She said, wrapping her knuckles on the wall. Soundproof. Isn't that great? It was. I returned to my room and thought about how awesome it was that I wouldn't be hounded by the noises of my neighbors like I had been back home. That night, I slept better than I had in years, and the next day, I took a ride on the city's municipal rail. I could get anywhere in the city for free and without creating any pollution. The rooftops were all solar panels, and supposedly there were wind turbines outside the wall somewhere. Mr. Mudgett had really done it. He'd built a self-sustained city full of good and decent people. I didn't much like my assigned job, but I couldn't complain. I'd put up with worse. No, my dissatisfaction began elsewhere. About five days in, I'd gotten used to my new surroundings and I was feeling brave. That night, I left my door slightly open. When I heard Melanie return to her apartment, I gave it about ten minutes, then went over and knocked. I had a whole excuse prepared about how I didn't know how to cook, but I did have this bottle of red wine I'd bought from the commissary on the first floor of our building. But she didn't answer. Were the doors soundproof too? I ring her doorbell. I waited for a good long minute before reaching up to ring it again. This time the door opened at the approach of my bracelet. Uh... I said loudly, directing my voice forward into the apartment. Your door just opened. No response followed. Awkwardly, I leaned in a little bit and looked this way and that. The bathroom was dark and empty, and the kitchen and living room area were pristine. Hello? I stepped fully inside. Melanie wasn't there. I checked my bracelet, which listed the apartment as unoccupied. But how was that possible? 
I literally heard her return home not 15 minutes prior. Now, not only was she not present, the system said her apartment wasn't owned at all. How had she even gotten out? I checked behind the couch, under the bed. There were no possessions, but that wasn't unusual since we'd all left everything behind when we'd arrived. The only strange detail I noticed was what looked like a bit of broken tile on the wall in the shower and the slightest trace of blood below, as if someone had slipped and hit their head. There was nothing I could do but return to my apartment. Gilmanton News was still the only channel, and it was on televisions on every street corner, in every shop, at the gym, and even in the bathroom. Two talking heads were busy debating which aspects of Gilmanton were great, or the greatest. I left it on, but didn't really pay attention until I wondered if I could get on that news program to ask about Melanie. Would that be weird? I let the idea simmer for a day or two. When I still hadn't seen her in that time, I decided to try and find the news studio. It wasn't listed on the map, but I wandered through the crowded city streets in search of an antenna powerful enough to send the signal. There was one toward the back of the industrial area, and I left the crowds behind to creep through the narrow maze-like alleys. The walls here were just plain brick with no decoration, and I found myself feeling a little claustrophobic. In one dead-end passage, I saw a pile of old tools and crowbars. By the time I found the base of the antenna structure, I was more than ready to leave. Especially because there was no new studio at all. Through a window, all I saw were big stacks of computers. That night, sitting in the dark in my apartment... I watched the news anchors and talking heads on Gilmanton News 1. I mean, I really watched them. After two or three hours, I began to see the same patterns in how they moved their heads or talked, and it was especially obvious after six hours. The people on the news were computer-generated. They were just facades reciting programmed talking points. That chilled me to my core. But it was a smart city, after all. Didn't it save money to not have a studio or staff when computer-generated reporters worked just as well? Still, I was left unsettled. The news was our only source of outside information, and according to them, the rest of the country was falling apart. Crime and illness were everywhere, spearheaded by corrupt politicians that were basically monsters. Meanwhile, Gilmanton was a shining example of perfection. We were safe from our fellow citizens outside. We were far more productive, and we had zero crime. I sent a few emails to old friends to confirm if that was the truth, but the system returned my messages with an error saying that those emails no longer existed. Maybe they changed. I wasn't sure. I tried to make some phone calls on my bracelet, but the system told me those numbers were no longer in service. We had the internet too, but it only seemed to be able to access local Gilmanton websites. Commercials all over these sites were full of citizens declaring how awesome the city was, and I scanned these until one caught my eye. It was Melanie. That was definitely her tiny picture next to her comment, and had been posted the day before. Did that mean she was alright and just moved to a different apartment? I wondered if I'd put her off somehow, and she'd move to get away from me. My concerns finally took me to Mr. Mudgett himself, the only actual person I could find that was in charge of anything, and he allowed me into his office with a warm smile. Of course, I'll look up your friend. He tapped away at his desktop computer, the only one I'd seen anywhere in Gilmanton, and he nodded. Says here she didn't feel like this was a good fit. She left the city to return to her old life. I shrugged. Oh, figures. Last week, Mudgett continued. Yep, nothing to worry about. She's back home. My blood ran cold. I kept my face neutral. Thanks for the info. Of course. How could she have left last week if she just 
commented earlier that day about how great the city was. I memorized her comment and began looking. There it was. On another forum, another user had used the exact same phrasing, including the same typo. Oh my god, it was... It was fake. The news, the comments, everything I'd perceived as my community, it was all fake. As I lay huddled under my blankets in bed, I realized I didn't really know anyone here at all. I'd wandered the labyrinthine streets, I'd seen crowds, but I didn't really have any friends. All the people I'd talked to and conversated with had been online. And I went through all my old conversations one by one until I found the same replies elsewhere. I'd literally been talking to programs, not people. And where the hell was Melody? I returned to her apartment, but it was owned. An extremely overweight man answered the door and seemed annoyed. I pushed past him and headed to the bathroom. Did you clean up the blood that was in here? He stopped complaining and said with concern. Uh, yeah? Why? I poked around in the shower until I noticed something odd. The bottom seemed to have a very thin black line. What's this? It started leaking after a couple days, he told me. Who knows why? I let that one pass to avoid hurting his feelings. His weight had broken something loose at the bottom of the shower. It seemed to move slightly when I pushed on it. I'll be back, I told him, and I left immediately for the industrial area of the city where I'd once seen discarded tools. They were the only useful objects I could think of. There existed no mechanisms elsewhere for the citizens to actually do anything useful. My neighbor was waiting for me with his door open when I returned with a crowbar. He too wanted to know what the hell was wrong with the shower. Together, we angled our might and the bottom of the shower fell away into darkness. It was a trap door. He stared at me in confusion. What is this? I could only shake my head. A sliding tube went down into darkness, slickened by the water of the shower itself. I think my previous neighbor fell here. Should I avoid taking showers then? Yes, I frowned. This is real. This is... dangerous. Ah, he only sort of seemed to grasp that something was wrong. Come on, so great. This must be a fluke. I'll call maintenance. I nodded in supposed agreement with him and made an excuse to leave. How oblivious could he be? They'd built a goddamn slide under Melanie's shower. The intent couldn't be anything else. The kind of thing wasn't an accident. In tracking the possible trajectory of that slide, and went down to the basement of my building and found more twisted and confusing tunnels lined with gray brick. These were not on my bracelet map. Before I knew it, I began making marks on the gray brick like I should have done from the start and slowly began to understand the lay of the area. When I came to the thick metal door, I was reasonably sure it held the destination of the slide and I forced it open with about 20 minutes of angry prying. What I saw in there will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was not just one slide ends of at least a dozen tubes jutted from the walls, some of them still spilling shower water. They were all pointed at various cages, which contained women that had fallen into them like ragdolls. One of the cages held a sullen and bloodied man. The tables between the cages held bodies in various stages of dissection, and there was a vat of acid in which a still living man was vainly trying to climb out along the smooth metal walls. The worst part? The underground menagerie of tortures was decorated like a ritzy office from the late 19th century. There were luxurious shelves containing old books, a fancy chair carved with century-old motifs, and a desk with, among other things, a quill and ink jar. There was not a dusty torture chamber, 
nor a place of grim business. Someone very much enjoyed this room. A whisper originated from a back cage, and I saw Melanie's gaunt face. She waved me over, and I skirted the acid vat and the one grasping woman from a table who was still alive despite her open chest cavity. Approaching the bars, I looked for the mechanism and began prying with my crowbar. She was free in moments, and she left behind the pile of people without a second glance. They had cushioned her fall and even given her some clothes, but none now lived. I was no hero. I didn't stay to free everyone else, nor did I try to ambush and fight whoever it was that had designed this nightmare factory of a city. Melanie and I ran through the confusing basement hallways for nearly an hour before finding the stairs up by pure luck. Mr. Mudgett was there in the lobby of our building, waiting for us with a grin. We ran past him and he made no move to stop us. They're killing people! We screamed at the few people walking by in the chill night air. There are trap doors under the showers and they're torturing and killing people in the basements. All we got were annoyed looks. One older man said, That would never happen in Gilmanton. Melanie screamed in his face and held up her bruised arms. What does this look like to you? You're just not worthy of living here. You've obviously made some bad choices. The man replied before moving on. It was then that we realized that nobody would hear us. Not only did they live in soundproof little cells, their minds were encased in similar prisons. Gilmanton News 1 was their only source of information, and every single day they were surrounded by automated comments and discussions reinforcing the idea that everything was alright and Gilmanton was perfect. Even if we got through to someone, the community at large would never listen to us. We ran a long and exhausting circle around the edge of the city that took until dawn, but there was no way out. We'd felt safe behind them for how well they'd kept out vagabonds, drifters, and other fears, but those walls kept us inside just as efficiently. As the sun crested the top of the buildings... Mr. Mudgett walked slowly up to us with that same grin. Finding a second wind, we ran again. We hid in a convoluted nest of alleys. Mr. Mudgett rounded a corner near noon, still grinning. Exhausted to the point of near collapse, we ran and hid in a highly populated shop. Mr. Mudgett entered to an array of applause from our fellow citizens. Thank you, thank you. Now, please go about your business. I'm a humble man. The others began to filter out at his unspoken request for privacy. Melanie screamed at them that he was going to kill us, that he was killing people even then, but they just spit on her and called her a crazy whore. When I insisted that she was telling the truth, they sneered and asked, what about those politicians outside these walls? They're far worse. Explain that before you try to recriminate the great Mr. Mudgett here. I stared at them in confused horror, but they left and the door to the shop swung shut after them. Mudgett watched us with that same eager grin. How do you always know where to find us? I demanded. <laughs> You're literally wearing a tracking device that tells me every single thing you say and do. I looked down at my bracelet. It had been required for every aspect of life. Even if I'd taken it off, I couldn't have opened doors, bought food, or taken the rail system. Somehow I really hadn't had a choice. He walked a slow, humored circle around us. Hmm. Shall it be the acid pit for you? Or perhaps asphyxiation? His eagerness grew as he spiraled closer. Maybe I'll see how many limbs and organs I can remove while still keeping you alive. I haven't tried that one in at least a hundred years. It really takes someone special to make that much effort worth it. Melody clutched my arm while asking. A hundred years? He can't be that old. His laugh was filled with pity. <laughs> you poor thing. 
I've been building my murder castles for a very long time. The phrase sparked something in my memory, but it wasn't possible. You can't be him. You, you, you can't be H.H. H. Holmes. They hung him for his crimes a hundred years ago. A simple bribe to the right people and they executed the wrong man, he said with a widening smirk. A trick I've used a dozen times while further delving into the secrets of extended life. I looked to the shop owner in the corner. The only one who had not left. But he just cowered and pretended not to notice us. There would be no help here. I raised my crowbar, but Mudgett's eyes lit up. Oh, don't try that. I so do love the sensation. You might even cause my organs to cease functioning for a few minutes. He leaned in close and breathed on my face. It's like a little... vacation from being alive. I'd welcome it. I stepped back, desperate for any option. In that motion, I felt my old cell phone in my jacket's inner pocket. With my free hand, I retrieved it, pretended to tap a few buttons, and held it up to my ear. I'll call the police. At that, his sadistic grin finally faded. That would be very annoying. I've only just now shut up shop. Let us go, I told him loudly. Just me and Melanie. We'll just go, and I'll never trouble you again. He shook his head. I can't allow that. You'll sing like canneries the moment you're free. He sighed. <sighs> the girl stays here. No! Melanie shouted at him. And will not be harmed, Mudgett continued with an annoyed tone. Your leverage is your knowledge, so I will not harm her. My leverage is her well-being, so you will not tell anyone what you've seen here. Fair deal? Melanie pleaded with her eyes, but I didn't see any other way out. I don't know if that made me a coward, an asshole, or both, but I had to take the deal. I apologized silently and turned away from her. Mudgett walked me to the front gate himself and let me go. He never even suspected that my phone was out of battery. I was forced to walk for miles to find civilization again, since he'd kept my belongings and keys. Not that it mattered. The cars outside had been cleared away, likely sold for scrap. As far as the world was concerned, Gilmanton didn't exist, and even if it did, nobody specific had ever moved there. I could still hear Melanie shouting for me over the walls, and I began my long walk home. That's why I've spent the last few years keeping a low profile, not telling anyone about the horror movie that is Gilmanton, even as more smart cities are slated for being built. Thing is, I don't think I'm risking Melanie's life by talking. I kept in contact by email so I could be sure she was safe, but in the last few months, I've started to notice patterns in her responses. I looked up the name of my overweight neighbor back in Gilmanton, whose shower I'd broken open and found one of those relatives. They, too, were still receiving emails from him. Words were the same. The emails were fake. I didn't tell them that. I didn't tell them that he was dead, and I didn't tell anyone that Melanie had probably been chopped into pieces minutes after I departed. I'd been corresponding with a program and never known it. But now I have to speak out. It's not just that more smart cities are being built. I survived a smart city built on a small scale, but now I'm starting to see the bigger picture. Whenever we give away our self-determination, whenever we give away free thinking, we put our fates in the hands of others. Men of wealth and vast cruelty have been building murder castles for a very long time, just as Mudgett said. The walls are not always bright silver, nor so obvious. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed um, tonight's stories. I thought they were pretty good. 
Um, and it actually gives me a, a chance to leave you with two questions tonight. The first one relates to the first story about the hallway in the woods. Now, when I was a kid and we would go visit my great grandmother, she lived in like, uh, not assisted living, but like an older folks kind of like apartment complex, you know? And they had these crazy, crazy deep woods behind her apartment complex. And while my mom was hanging out with her, we would go and hang out in the woods. Obviously, we wouldn't go much further than maybe, I don't know, like 10, 15 feet back. Maybe like half a mile. Who knows? We were young and stupid. But it that story made me think about how I was so lucky as a kid to never get seriously hurt out there because I, I, I'm almost 28. So, like, back then we didn't really have cell phones when I was a kid. Um, so getting hurt out there when it was just me and my brothers would be a really bad thing. And I just thought about, like, how lucky I was that I never saw anything crazy out there or never got seriously hurt while I was out there. So... Did you do that as well when you were a kid? I know my audience is a little bit older than me, but there are some people my age who can maybe relate to it, but I'm interested to hear if you all ever had anything strange or scary happen to you out in the woods, because I got lucky. It never happened to me. The scariest thing that ever happened was we came across, uh, this was later, I was maybe 11 or 12, we came across a lake me and a friend, and we were just kind of hanging around on the bank, and then some older guy from across the lake yelled at us to leave because it wasn't our property, which is fine, whatever. Um, So that's, like, the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I've never found, like, stairs in the woods or a hallway in the woods. I wouldn't go into either one of them if I did, but that's just me. Let me know what uh, what you've experienced in the woods in your years. Second question, and I think I know the answer that most people are going to give to this one. Would you live in a community like the one talked about in the second story? Now, let's assume they're not killing you or putting you in vats of acid or anything like that. Let's just assume it's a gated community that's kind of cut off from the rest of the world. Maybe cult is a strong word to use in this situation, but maybe it's not. Would you try it at least? Like do a trial run, maybe like a week or a month even? Just to kind of, I don't know, play with the idea? It's an interesting thought. I don't think I would do it. I'm, I'm, just the idea of that kind of freaks me out. Not having certain freedoms to myself. It's just strange. But I want to hear what you all think. While you're down there um, answering those questions, I'm going to take a minute to thank all of our $5 patrons and members. That's Absinthe Alice, Amethyst, Amet, Ann Barry, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, Ellis G, Furious Weasel, If In Doubt, Flat Out, Jennifer Dameron, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Flanning, Lee Riggs, Laura, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Warwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, The New On Gelm 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all so much for listening tonight, or in the afternoon, or the morning, whenever you listen. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day today. And as always, take care of yourselves and everyone around you. Good night, everyone.